Peter Nygaard, a Made in Manitoba success story. But two Indigenous women in Winnipeg say, he's a homegrown nightmare. The two women tell us it's concerning that Canadian police have not acted on their complaints with the same interest as American investigators. Especially after he was charged criminally in the US last year. The women made complaints to Winnipeg Police Service in 2020. So they wonder, why the wait? out of the gate. <laughs> I had, um, it literally was just going to be um, just something so I could get out of the house. I was a new mom. <laughs> I mean, as much as I think new moms can get this is that you love your child more than anything, but you need like adults to talk to. <laughs> Anouk Serena Hicks lived with her husband and son in the early 1990s. My husband at the time, you know, he'd go, he went to work every day, and um, I was just like, look, <laughs> we, my son and I are really going to converse so much here, he's a baby. And uh, so I was starting to look for part-time jobs, and I was hired at a store owned by Peter Nygaard. And uh, it, honestly, it was, it was literally probably the happiest part of my life. I was surprised because the target of clients was uh, you know women older than me and then when they told me that I was wearing the clothes on top of it I was like okay that's interesting but I'll roll with it. The female manager at the time complimented her often. And I was very petite and um, so it was it was very nice it was very nice to have someone who um, gave me that attention. Nygaard has not been charged with crimes in Canada, and no allegations have been proven in court arising from the charges in the U.S. His lawyers have not responded to our requests. Hicks did not want to appear on camera alone. She invited a trusted friend to be with her. She and James Favell have volunteered with Winnipeg's Bear Clan together for years. Out of the blue, Serena contacted me and asked if I would be part of this. And um, I tell you, I was quite honored um, to be asked to be here. You know, traditionally in our culture, uh, the women, you know, choose the men that they trust to sit around the council fire. And so to be chosen to sit around this fire today is, is a real honor. It was at the end of the shift, you know, um, everyone had left the store. And really, there, it hadn't, I kind of remember it not being a busy day. Um, and the reason I say that is because it's kind of an important thing that I didn't pick up on, was that it wasn't a busy day. She says her manager told her to clean out the back dressing room when Nygaard visited the retail outlet. She was upset. As Nygaard was leaving the store, he said, I'll see you in New York. Hicks says she went home and just shut down. I, to this day, still have no memory of how I got home. I just remember getting home and, like, just taking everything off and just getting in the shower, and I just... I threw up. But one detail keeps coming back to her. It was so strange, too, because all I could think of was... I'm in my favorite skirt. I remember thinking, like, because I knew I was meeting him that day, and not one item actually had been bought in there because I needed to feel really strong. And it was the favorite outfit that my husband actually had bought in me. It was just this beautiful purple skirt and this, this white blouse and right down to like the mother of pearl, like necklace and earrings. She went to work the next day. I was so scared of him that 
I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could just drop off. Like, I was terrified. I, I, I just felt like I couldn't, I needed time. I knew I worked part-time. I had one shift the next day. I was going to fulfill it, and I needed time to think. She says there was a plane ticket to New York ready for her when she arrived that morning. That was the second I knew I had to do something. I couldn't get on that plane. She deserted her little family bubble. I didn't think my husband would ever look at me the same, so I just didn't ever want to tell him. <laughs> So I had, I had a little bit of time, like, to go, and I realized that I had to disappear. Telling her husband a lie. So I told my husband at the time that I had met somebody, because <laughs> I didn't want him to track me down. I didn't want him to try and get me back, and <laughs> and he is like the most amazing dad. So. I left them. <laughs> Hicks told other media outlets her story in the winter of 2020. A class action lawsuit against Peter Nygaard was launched in February 2020, originally filed by 10 women. That class action filed in the U.S. now contains allegations by 57 women. The women, mostly called Jane Doe's, allege in the U.S. class action that Nygaard committed acts of sexual assault and sex trafficking. In spring 2020, the media attention on Nygaard intensified. Come March, I was realizing more and more that he was becoming more and more in the news, and pictures were just everywhere, and it's... <sighs> Let's just say keeping food down, not so easy. Stop glamorizing him is the most awful thing. Hicks says she called the class action lawyers in the U.S. The first time I ever said out loud that this happened to me was July 2020. And it was to a lawyer who I had questions. I thought I had questions, and I ended up phoning her, and then just everything just fell out. Everything. Everything just started, like, falling out of my mouth. Hicks's story did not make it into the court documents because that class action was put on hold in summer 2020. In December 2020, prosecutors in the U.S. charged Nygaard and his companies with nine criminal offenses in New York including sex trafficking, racketeering, and related crimes. Nygaard is currently in a Winnipeg prison, awaiting a hearing about possible extradition to the U.S. Toronto-based therapist Shannon Maroney is treating dozens of the other class action Canadian claimants, including Hicks. I received an email in about April of last year uh, from an organization in the Bahamas called Our Sanctuary which explained in the email that they are a nonprofit organization that provides uh, therapy and also education for sexual assault survivors across the Bahamas. She quickly realized the alleged victims were from all over Canada. For Maroney, the victims like Hicks, who are Indigenous, represent an especially vulnerable class. And so when we look broadly then at Indigenous experiences, Indigenous lived reality, those vulnerabilities are vast. They're appalling and they're, they're shameful. She says many of the women she is treating have similar backgrounds. And again, they were victims that were economically disadvantaged, educationally disadvantaged, racially disadvantaged. And she also wonders why Nygaard has not been charged in Canada. Well, I think it's appalling. I think that it's embarrassing for Canada. In fact, a 1980 rape charge was stayed in Winnipeg after the woman refused to testify. 
and the list from the U.S. class action goes all the way back to 1977. So why no charges from Canadian authorities? It's just this overwhelming sense of frustration that Canada continues to fail us, continues to fail Indigenous women, continues to fail. Complaints made in 2020 were investigated by the U.S. Grand Jury, and that indictment was brought in December 2020. So why the wait in Canada? I just feel bad for the models that are still left up, like how bad yeah. that must be to keep seeing that, you know? Yeah. Like it just kind of breaks my heart. Serena Hicks worked as a social worker for 20 years. And I refused, I refused to not have my name out there because I have advocated, and James knows this, I've advocated for so many women through the years that if I hid my name, what would this not say to them? That I was strong enough for them, but not strong enough for me? She says back then she wouldn't have gone to the police. As that little Eskimo girl, I already knew you don't go to the police, you don't trust the police. I didn't feel comfortable because there was racism there. There was no way that was even an option, I felt. Because here I was, this 20, 21 year old who Who was going to believe me against someone like that? And who would care? In July 2020, she finally filed her police report with the Winnipeg police. I gave a police report. I still haven't heard from the Crown. Canada, I don't have the faith in, but the FBI, for some reason, I have faith in. I think 100% the police do not want to show their shameful side. And they're failing. Yeah, yeah they are failing. In fact, in the U.S. class action, it is alleged on behalf of one of the complainants that she was told Nygaard owned the Winnipeg police, something the police declined to comment on. That's something Hicks can relate to. The thing is, is that when you can't trust the people who are supposed to protect you, and you, that scares me. That literally terrifies me. Um, it's systemic, and it's something that we've been dealing with for a very long time, and there's nothing uh, new about this situation. This is, this is typical. Yeah. Yeah. They protect the wrong people, yeah. um, and the people that need the protection aren't getting it, and that's the sad part. We saw pictures of them with city councillors, the mayors. We saw all that. There was nobody that I could trust. Therapist Shannon Maroney says Nygaard's accusers have reported to several police forces. Some of those women had reported in Canada and nothing was ever done about it. And that is a crime in and of itself, I think. And they think, and that's what it feels like. And so I think it's incredibly important that Canadians be asking what has gone wrong here? You know, and what is going wrong? Because now we do have a situation in Canada where in, but in my knowledge, to my knowledge, close to 20 women have now given statements to police and he still does, has not faced Canadian charges. Winnipeg police, per their policy, would neither confirm nor deny an active investigation. They declined our request for an interview. Only the Toronto Police Service would confirm there is an ongoing investigation. I mean, I understand the, the threshold. I understand that it's difficult to bring historical cases. Um, I understand all of that. It doesn't make it less frustrating uh, and less angering that Still, it seems like, and it certainly seems like to the survivors that I'm supporting, that nothing is being done here. And they are asking questions like, well, are Canadian authorities just going to ride on the coattails of the FBI? Maroney says the Winnipeg police don't inspire her confidence. 
uh, I do have confidence that we will now uh, see some charges coming forward, particularly out of Toronto. Um, but I don't, in, I don't have confidence. Um, and that's based on what I have heard from my survivors and what their experiences have been with the police, particularly in Winnipeg, that, that uh, any charges are coming forward from there soon. And that's a disgrace. She also reached out to the RCMP. Personally, I think that this needs to be an investigation uh, at a federal level, uh, if that's possible, because it, it is international. It's international trafficking in many cases. Uh, and because of the sheer scope of it, that this is how it's been handled in the U.S., and I think it should be handled in Canada the same way. We asked RCMP for an interview. They declined, saying they aren't coordinating the cases, but could be directed to do so by federal and provincial authorities. The RCMP does not coordinate investigations on behalf of other agencies unless mandated to do so. Justice Minister David Lametti's office declined an interview as well, but sent an email by way of explanation. Justice Canada is not responsible for criminal investigations or prosecutions. But the lack of charges is not the only issue raising eyebrows. You know, like reading the news lately, you're seeing Crystal Brown is a justice development coordinator with the Southern oh, Chiefs organization in Manitoba. So my initial act reaction was uh, frustration, anger, um, and quite honestly, disgust. Um, it just continued to reaffirm what we as Indigenous people know, that the criminal justice system doesn't work the same as it does for non-Indigenous people. According to this affidavit filed by Headingley Correctional Centre staff in Nygaard's bail appeal hearing, Mr. Nygaard has phone access from 0700 hours to 2300 hours daily. No other cell at HCC has similar phone access. Due to Mr. Nygaard's request for constant contact with his legal team, this is the only location at which we can accommodate him and ensure his safety due to the high-profile nature of his case. And I'm going to call them amenities, uh, the two mattresses, the access to the telephone, um, the large living space that uh, he gets to live in. Um, you know, um, I just... I felt for the inmates that are currently in Headingley. So I immediately thought, how is this possible? She says Canada is failing Nygaard's accusers. Canada continues to fail us, continues to fail Indigenous women, continues to fail. James Fable agrees. Um, you know, it's, it's emblematic of this, the, the abuses that our women have had to endure, you know, since time immemorial, really. Um, no voice, nobody to back them up, um, nobody to go to, um, to, to support and, and to seek justice from. And so that's one of the things that I've tried to busy myself with over the last, you know, all my life kind of thing is, is to be that anti-bully and, and to be there and support people that need supports. And right now, uh, Serena's one of those people. For Hicks, the days are long. I know my truth. I know. I feel it. It's, it's, it's literally got me paralyzed some, most days. My justice is just going to be me getting better and trying to find out who I am without this 10-ton boulder sitting inside of me is the biggest secret of my life, you know? And I wake up and, you know, for the past 20, 30 years of it fight or flight, that's how I've woken up. 
my anxiety, my panic, I was willing to deal with it as long as I never had to talk about it, as long as no one had to know, because I didn't have the supports. I didn't have the right, well, I don't even know if there's a right way, you know, but I did the best I could to protect the, 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 the two people I loved the most. And she's never forgiven herself for leaving. I never have. <laughs> Next week on APTN Investigates. When I first entered institutions, I was 11 years old. And this is from the, the abuse I suffered in the first, first foster home. So then I was already troubled. I was mute. So I, would, I wasn't talking. I was just like, I, I wouldn't talk because of the abuse. was so internalized um, and I wouldn't speak about it because it was like oh nobody's gonna believe me this is what I guess this is what how, how my life was supposed to be so then at that time I was running away to my mom's and my stepdad's and uh I would go, I went there and I was like, oh, mom, I have a modeling opportunity. Nadine Lustus is speaking about her past for the first time. Nobody wants to face their demons, face their past, face the abuses our social injustices. Like it took me a lot of balls and a lot of courage to do that. Coming from the street, huh. so I did it because it needed to be done. And I knew I wasn't the only one. That's the start of healing, that's how it starts. That's how it begins is by saying something and speaking about it. Mm -hmm.